National Women's Soccer League begins its season April 9th, and there has never been more eyes on the NWSL than there are right now. As the league continues to grow, they continue to add teams, and the quality players continue to pile up. And to talk about it all, we have Sean Goodwin, writer over at the Kansas City Star, who is covering Kansas City's new NWSL expansion. We're going to talk all things Kansas City, and we're going to talk all things NWSL 2021. Sean, man, thanks so much for being here. Let's start with Kansas City. Uh, this mm -hmm. is a, this is a new team. It's it's so new they don't even have a name yet. So, yeah. uh, what uh, what talk generally about what this team can bring in their in their first season because this is not your typical expansion team that we'd be used to seeing. Yeah, it's as you said, Griffiths. Like we said before, the video stars like the Washington football team of the NWSL. They don't have a name, just Kansas City NWSL. <laughs> um, but you know, if like you say, it's not a typical expansion team that we see in you know any sport really, honestly. Right. I mean, you know, even in NWSL, we do have recent Louisville coming in, and they are a true expansion team. Like they had the expansion draft, um, all kinds of jazz. But no, Kansas City. Um, for fans who were, you know, fans of the sports in the last couple of years, you know, we had FC Casey here from 2013 to 2017. They won two NWSL trophies, two championships. Mm -hmm. And then they left for Utah because of poor management or poor ownership, I should say. Right. Uh, went to Utah, spent a couple of years there. They sucked. Lowed, lowed, oh my gosh. Delroy Hansen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Owner there, you know, he got into a bunch of trouble, which, you know, if we want to get into, we can, but that's going down a whole rabbit hole. So <laughs> yeah, he just, yeah, yeah so I, think, he, I think we can avoid that one. Yeah, so, you know, he's forced to sell up, and then basically, uh, without getting into the nitty gritty part of it all, uh, the owners of the Kansas City team, Chris and Angie Long, they wanted to bring a team to Kansas City regardless. They started talking about it in March, April 2020. We're going to like, you know, we'll, we'll start talking about it now. We'll bring an expansion team for 2022. And then once all the stuff with Devil Lee Hansen went down and they realised that the Utah team was going to, you know, fold or move, uh, they quickly moved to snatch it up. And with that, they got all of their players, all of their draft picks. It's essentially the exact same team. It's just basically a relocation, but it's being branded as an expansion. Uh, which which is crazy because again I mean that's just not something that we've seen I guess since the whole Cleveland Browns Baltimore Colts Ravens thing in the NFL and that was what 40 years ago I mean this this is yeah. not something we're used to seeing in American professional sports no we're not but uh, because of that you know you, you asked what they can bring Griff that was the uh, original question I think before I went off on my tangents <laughs> Um, Your tangent was part of my question, so it's all good. That's okay. Uh, yeah, as, as for what they can bring, you know, the, the Utah team wasn't too great, but I mean, I haven't even heard from the players. Like, I, I was talking to Mallory Weber. She's been out on loan with Adelaide United, and she, she's got that a little bit of the Australian lingo now. She says that it was a bin in um, Utah. She, it wasn't trash. It was a bin. <laughs> it, was a bin. Yeah, yeah, like, it wasn't oh. trash. It was the whole trash can. Yeah, well, she's going to say trash can, it's just a bing. I was like, Mario, you've been there for a year and you're picking up this Australian lingo. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, obviously the ownership, that kind of all went downhill, but even the management wasn't great, I believe. So, yeah. you know, you've got Hugh Williams, who was the assistant coach to Black Cow, and then obviously, obviously the women's national team coach now. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the assistant coach when he was in KC and they won the championship, so... No, they should be an exciting team. I know he won, the one thing that Hugh has been saying the whole preseason is it, it may sound weird. It, I don't even know if I had a definition before Hugh Williams made it a definition, but he said it'll be a classic Midwest team. And what what is a classic <laughs> Midwest team? What what does that mean to you, Griff? Uh, in a in a soccer context, I guess it would mean a little bit more physically dominant. I would think yeah. a little a little bigger uh, and you know taking control of the game in in the midfield more. Yeah, I mean yeah, it's it gritty, it's tough. Okay, uh, right. and they will be a very attacking team as well. 
Okay. Uh, you know, he he wants his wing backs to attack, and we can get him on good tactics in a second if you want. Um, but on the very base level, yes, it's they haven't conceded a goal through all the preseason. They beat Orlando 1 0, KU 2 0, and Kansas State 3 0. Mm-hmm. You know, two collegiate teams, but like I think it was Florida or Florida State just beat Orlando. So, yeah. you know, it's. Yeah, so you know you do have these college teams that can compete. So, so you not even can see the goal and not really be threatened. Uh, that looks good for them. But I, I know Hugh still isn't happy with the goal scoring right now. But mm-hmm. as in this season, if they can if they can continue to be def- solid defensively, uh, yeah, this will be a very attack minded team. So who is going to be the ringleader of this? If this is going to be a tough, gritty team, then you're going to want that that leadership on the pitch and off the pitch. So who's that going to be this year? Yeah, um, I think at the end of the day, you know, a, a lot of folks go to Amy Rodriguez, you know, she, I mean, she has the pedigree that she's got. Uh, but, you know, what, what, what is that? What is that pedigree? Just just talk quickly about that. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I have to pull up her exact, uh, exact honors, I guess. Give me a quick second. But, you know, I mean, she's, what, 34 now? And, let me jump to her honors, honors and awards. I mean, you know, two-time Olympic gold medaler, medalist. Um, <laughs> she was on the women's team in the 2015 World Cup. She was runner-up in 2011. You know, she's won all sorts of international cups. She was here in Kansas City in 2014, 2015, when FC Kansas City won the NWSL Championship. Mm-hmm. You know, she's she's been around it all. She's been doing it now for years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so that's, like, that's the semi-easy answer, of course. But if we're going to look elsewhere, I honestly think at the back, Rachel Corsi. Uh, she's the uh, Scotland's national team captain. Uh, you know, her and Kate Del Father seem to be the, the centre-back pairing. Um, yep. Yeah, at the back. Uh, I think it's all going to start from Rachel with her leadership, with, you know, her toughness and grittiness and you know she she isn't shy about taking a ball and running you know running into the midfield but uh, it's usually Del Father who's doing that and of course he's you know happier to sit back and do that dirty work you know mopping up um, dealing with the onrushing attackers so mm-hmm. uh, yeah I think I don't think there's an official like you know vice captain named uh, but yeah. definitely sure and then I think the second one is a uh, Desiree Scott, a uh, Canadian international. The nickname is literally the Destroyer. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, she again, she plays the six, so you know she's going to be in that midfield. Right, that's fitting. That's fitting. Yeah, uh, she's in the midfield there. So you know, ex- again with Hugh Williams' tactics, it's her and Gabby Vincent who's kind of going to be her backup. It seems both of those ladies, um, they are solid. You know. Uh, so far, it's all been um, closed to media, but they left me into the K-State game. Mm-hmm. Uh, Desiree Scott, she'd already left. Oh, she was in Kansas City, but they didn't play her. But she'll be away for the first game against Portland because uh, of Canadian international duty. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was watch- watching Gabby Vincent, and, you know, she she was picking her times to go forward and back uh, very well. You know, sometimes she'd just be sitting in front of Del Favre and Corsi, kind of, you know, giving those triangle options with those two and the wing backs. And other times she was up the field playing passes to the likes of Amy Rodriguez and she scores the team's first goal actually, it was a header from a corner. So again, two two gritty players who aren't afraid to you don't know when they've lost, if they even have lost, you know? Yeah, like if, absolutely. If they're losing a battle, they'll just keep going. So that's some of those big names when we talk about a classic Midwest team. Yeah, I think about for Vincent, uh, Scott, and Corsi for my big three there. Well, so it seems like if you're the kind of team that is dealing with the circumstances that Kansas City has had to deal with over the last few years over in Utah that you alluded to earlier, it's always important for teams to have leaders and have really tough, gritty individuals uh, to help them along when the times get tough as we know but specifically when you're dealing with these kinds of circumstances it seems like it's even more important that you have those rocks that you can lean on and it seems like from a tactical perspective that's kind of 
what's fueling Kansas City the way that, that you describe them is obviously from an emotional standpoint, you have these rocks that, that you can lean on. But also from a tactical standpoint, there are those players that you're going to turn to when when you need things to happen. To give, a, to give an example, we just talked about the U.S. men's national team uh, in a video last week, and it would be like the Kristen Pulisic, the, the guy that... When you need something done, you need to give the ball to that yeah. guy, and it seems like Kansas City has that person or people. Yeah, uh, you know, they, they certainly have those people. I mean, I I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but I I remember researching. I guess it was a couple of months back now, and eight or nine of the players still on this team they were here back in the FC Kansas City days. Wow. And, you know, like like some of those, like you know, the Rodriguez, and then there's like. Nicole Barnhart, who's like probably the second, maybe third string goalkeeper at this point. Um, but you know, because of uh, Lola Bonks, I was on that team. Yeah. Uh, trying to think who else. But uh, yeah, there was a few. And you know, so you've got those ladies who they were here, they left, they went through all the Utah stuff. And you know, they know what it's like to play in Kansas City. So from the emotional standpoint, you know, I think we're all happy to be back here too, from the sound of things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, you've definitely got the players that you can turn to, and you know they brought in several top players too. I mean, Mariana Larraquet, Argentinian forward, uh, she will missed the first game as well. She got called up to the Argentina squad about an hour ago, actually. Um, That's a pretty so, good problem to have, I think. If, yeah, if you're no, missing players for international duty. Yeah, yeah. So you know, because when once we get into the, the grander scheme of the whole league in a little bit. You know, you'll find that Kansas City is in a really good position, I think, in that, you know, they have a couple of Canadian players, they have Lara Kett, they have Rachel Corsi for Scotland, but they don't have any US women's national team players who are going to get called up for, like, the Olympics and, you know, miss a big chunk of the season. And there's yeah. other teams in the league, like, I know Portland is really heavily affected by this. Yeah, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to them as well. I think people will be sure. surprised the, the number of... Uh national team players that are here in the NWSL. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when when the Olympics kicks off and, um, you know, the qualifiers and just even friendlies and stuff, you know, those players are going missing and Kansas City doesn't really have that issue, to be honest. It's a relatively low-key team, but one that, again, you, we'll get to the expectations for the league and whatnot on a bit. I'm not expecting them to come storming out and winning the Challenge Cup and winning the uh, NWSL Shields and all sorts. But yeah. they, they certainly should be doing better than what you were doing back in Utah for those couple of years when he didn't make a playoffs once. It certainly sounds like they're trending in the right direction. Uh, what has the community involvement been like now that this team has returned? Yeah, um, I, honestly, you know, when, when it comes to straight up, you know, team and the community itself, it's been tough because of COVID, obviously. Yeah. Um, but, you know, even just through social media and, you know, uh, interaction with fans and they will have fans for the first game. Um, they haven't said how many yet, but I think it's going to be 50% capacity. That's what it sounds like it's going to be. Um, but just from the city welcoming, welcoming the team, it's so much better than what it was like, you know, back in the 2013 to 2017 time period. And yeah. a big issue with that time period too was, again, doing a shifting market, the team well, like they were marketing towards youth girl soccer, which is nothing wrong with that, but that was like their main focus. Um, and it, it kind of fell apart there, but now it's the focus seems a lot better. The city's embraced the team. Uh, they did have a really cool Union Station welcome about a month ago now, I'd say. It was when they got back from Orlando, where you were doing their warm weather training. Uh, there was a giant banger at Union Station. Uh, all the, you know, the whole team was there, there were pictures, yeah. and fans could come in. You know, people, people could see the team from distance for a while, and then, again, they're being very conscious because of COVID, so the team left, but they left the big banger up there, and uh, it was like, you know, I what the phrase was now. I think it was we play for KC, like the big lights and stuff. Yeah. So that's been cool. Um, and what's the other thing I was going to say? Oh, right. Again, it was it was around the same time. Anyone who's familiar with Kansas City, if you not look it up, but uh, like when there's Red Friday for the Chiefs, uh, they'll do it for the Royals. 
uh, you know, the whole city, all of its largest buildings will turn on the, the lights like that colour. So, like a city skyline will be red or blue. And for um, the NWSL team, um, it was light blue. It was the whole city was coloured light blue, uh, which was super cool to see as well. Wow. So, yeah, so they're definitely welcomed uh, into the city. And I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people excited to have another soccer team here. And I think that plays into the whole idea that. Kansas City has always says it's you know, it's the capital of the US capital of soccer kind of deal. Uh, and when you have a NWSL team here previously that got bad support, frankly, it takes tough to hold that title, right? Yeah. So I think, well, and especially with the level of success that that, that yeah, team yeah. enjoyed. <laughs> exactly. You a championship winning team and you barely heard about it. And, you know, I get we had the Royals in 2015 and like, the 2014 World Series too. And uh, I guess that was when the Chiefs first brought in Alex Smith and things were looking a bit exciting there. And yeah. Sporting, they were winning their US Cups and they were off, coming off a pretty fresh MLS Cup victory, I think in 2013. Yep. So, yeah, there was a decent period for other Kansas City sports. But then when you've got the women's team winning two championships and it's barely even whispers, yeah, it's... It wasn't a good. It should be exciting this time around. Well, I, I think that leads really well into talking about the league as a whole because that problem mm-hmm. is not contained only to Kansas City. As we know, the National Women's Soccer League, it's been around for a number of years, and only now is it starting to kind of creep into the the more generally known sports leagues in America. Um, and I think I think the NWSL is a league. Uh, deserves some credit for what they've done, signing a deal, uh, a TV deal with CBS. They're going to have all of their games televised uh, on either CBS Sports Network or on Paramount Plus, uh, which I think is is a really good move for them. I think as a sports league, you need to make sure that anyone can see all of your games. Um, and Paramount Plus, you know, it depends on how you feel about different streaming networks, but that one I think is a, is a pretty good deal. Uh, so I yeah. think you'll you'll draw in a lot of people who might be curious and, and want to go watch that. And the other thing with the NWSL just as a whole, we as American soccer fans, we have this expectation that American players will go play overseas, certainly on the men's side. That is the case. And basically everyone yeah. who plays for the men's national team is playing overseas. That's where you're going to get uh, the, the best competition. So that's what we're used to. But on the women's side, I think people would really be surprised how many uh, how many U.S. women's national team players, the, 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 the types of players that were winning World Cups for the U.S. are actually here in America playing their club soccer in the NWSL. Uh, almost every team has, <clears throat> excuse me, at least uh, one or two. Um, and so you talked about the Portland Thorns earlier. Portland is going to be one of the favorites this year. And yeah. uh, the format, for those of you who don't know, they play the NWSL Challenge Cup. That's what's going to be starting here in a few days. And then they'll transition into the regular season. Uh, and so Portland's going to be a favorite in both. And they are led by several uh, women's national team players, including Becky, Becky Sauerbrunn, uh, Lindsey Horan. They just got Crystal yeah. Dunn. So yeah. Portland, anchored by that level of player, looks like they're the favorite, no? Oh, no. it's. I think definitely it's going to be between Portland and the Reign this year. You know, uh, the Reign formally being, uh, why am I forgetting their name? Um, Griff, help me here. Uh, well, now, see, now you've, now you've got me. Now you've got him, you forget anything as well. Yeah, um, give me a second. Uh, Seattle Reign, yeah, sorry. There's, you know, the Seattle Reign FC yeah. and it's, it's been taken over by Leon. Um, so, you know, they've now got the power of French Leon, um, you know, winning soccer money behind them. And, you know, you're talking about the uh, NWSL in America being one of the top leagues for women's soccer. Yeah, I think the, the big three, honestly, uh, America, England, and France seem to be the big three. So, you know, Leon is now pouring money into the rain. So you've got them, and like I say, you've got Portland backed by Sabron, you've got Christine Sinclair of Canada. Yeah. Uh, you know, they brought in a, like I said, Crystal Dung, and they've just got a new goalkeeper too, Shelby Hogan out of Providence. Uh, she was a 2019 Big East Goalkeeper of the Year. So, 
you know, they they have a lot of good players and they should be one of the favourites. But as we were saying, especially with the Olympics coming up and so many of these players are, you know, being taken away for a long time. It, that can mix things up, especially in a season like coming off COVID and whatnot as well. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, and so from the perspective of Portland, uh, they seem to be making a push to to win it this year when probably more eyes are on the NWSL than we've ever seen. Uh, but there's another there's another team that is kind of going in the opposite direction uh, just in terms of how they've kind of been ravaged by some situations that are out of their control, and that's the Orlando Pride. They seem to be looking pretty good going forward. Uh, Alex Morgan's on that team, Sidney LaRue, some players that you might know from the uh, national team. Um, they're both out. The Pride has loaned out a bunch of players. So this is a team that looked like they might have been able to challenge the likes of the Rain and Portland. But now, I mean, where do they stand? Yeah, I mean, they had a the Orlando Pride. You know, they started off really strong when they first came into the league. And it's just kind of been a slippery slope down ever since. But like you said, it, a lot of it is out of their control. Uh, you know, with COVID, they sent all eight, I think, of their players off to Europe. Uh, and then they brought in a bunch of... Uh, they brought in a bunch of basically short-term contract players last season mm-hmm. when you were playing in the Challenge Cup. And one of those, Jordan Listro, is now actually just signed for Kansas City last week. Uh, she got her break. But you know, going back to Orlando, yeah, I mean, you know, Alex Morgan is... Uh, she's been stuck with injuries. Sydney LaRue had a kid, I think, in 2019. Um, even heading into this year, you know, Viviana Villacorsa, she, she was a she was got a first round pick from UCLA, which yep. and a tremendous up. player as well. I yeah. I can say from experience, having watched her in college, terrific player. Yeah, and then uh, you know she along along with many other players. Um, sorry, I just saw West Ham score in six minutes. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, sorry. No, so yeah, so you know, like many players in the 2021 draft, they've decided to stay for the spring season, just because you know it, it's their last because of COVID messing things up, and it's their possibly their last year playing for college. So yeah, Viviana Villacorsa stays with UCLA, and in the first aim of the spring season, tears her ACL. She's out for 2021. Oh. Um, Absolutely brutal. Yeah, so you know now you're looking at the second round pick, Michaela Collahan. Uh, BYU player again. I've got a stack here: 28 goals, 16 assists in 57 games. Uh, so you know, when, and uh, she's a forward too. So when you've got players like Marta and you know Alex Morgan, Sydney Larue, you know, I think that's where their hopes are going to be lying. Not their hopes, but you know, it's when they're looking to try and build out of like, a slump. That I don't think they're going to get out of this year. That's one of the games that they'll be looking to. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that now this year there's that extra wrinkle of players, you know, like you said, going back for their college seasons um, and then, you know, potentially trying to make their returns or their debuts in the NWSL after that. Uh, uh-huh. But, you know, obviously the injury concerns are there and we're seeing we're, we're seeing lots of teams like it, it almost seems like for every team, there's all kinds of different issues uh, that that they're dealing with, you know, whether it's players going out on loan, whether it's uh, high draft picks deciding that they're going to go back to school. Um, one of the teams that really stuck out to me in terms of, you know, what they're what they're dealing with from the loan perspective, from the perspective of they've decided to let players go abroad, is Racing Louisville. Um, yeah. They have several of their top talent, including two uh, U.S. national team players, Tobin Heath and Kristen Press, yep. on loan right now. So from their perspective, when you look at their roster, they look like a team that can compete. But from the players that are going to suit up this year for the NWSL team, maybe not quite on that level. Yeah, no, it's... You know, thanks to the expansion draft, they did bring in some solid players. But yeah, Tobin, Keith and Kristen Press, like you both said. Alton Man U, and you've got Alana Kennedy with Tottenham and Caitlin Ford of Arsenal. You know, again, all these players going to England, being one of those top leagues. And, 
I mean, he'd been there for a while now and their loans have been extended because of the whole COVID situation. They were playing in England, they weren't playing here and, you know, they wanted playtime, so what are you going to do? Um, <laughs> but I, I think, you know, racing Louisville, I think they're one of those teams this year where, yeah, you know, I think we all kind of realise that expansion team, they're okay, but don't tell them we're going to lose because they won't listen to you. Uh, I think I, they are one. But no, and I say that in the best way possible. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. They have, uh, that's it's it's, a, it's it's really high praise to heap. I think on a, on an expansion team to say that already right out of the gate they don't have that kind of attitude of you know we're just lucky to be here. We're just going to try to compete. They they have that attitude of we're going to try to win right now. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, it's the attitude at least, right? You know. Every single game, I think they have a lot. They have a lot of good young players who, you know, maybe, maybe they haven't been worn down by the professional life yet. <laughs> they're, they're young; they want to play still. And it's, it's players who, because of COVID, you know, they haven't got a lot of play time. I mean, there's a few names even we're familiar with. Griff haven't gone to KU. Mm-hmm. Uh, Addison Eric, former KU player. That's right. Uh, she would have been North Carolina Courage when she was drafted in um, 2019. So, you know, she's not been in the league for long and COVID happens. Uh, you've got Aaron Simon, who's coming from the dash on the other side. That's two, that's two really good wing backs. And then yep. top two young kids, both Kansas kids. Uh, Katie McClare from Wichita went to KU. Yep. And she the standout at KU. When, honestly, in that period, where not to talk college soccer too much, uh, but KU kind of made that leap from a solid Big 12 program to a top 25 program. Yeah, and that's right. McClure's kind of in that mix. That's right. And, and uh, I got to say, from McClure's perspective, when it comes to if you're an expansion team and you need to be hyper focused on, you know, maximizing the dollar, making sure that, that you have everything that you need. And Katie McClure is such a valuable weapon to have there because she can do so many things well that you kind of yeah. just put her up there. And it's like if you need her to be a false nine, if you need her to get behind the defense, whatever you need her to do, she is going to be able to do that even at a professional level so that to me seems like a really good pickup for a team that you know just wants someone they can plug in without having to worry if she's going to be able to do her job yeah no so yeah i mean everything you said there is correct about casey and then right next to her you've got cc kaiser who i went to high school with cc actually <laughs> uh, fun fact again she was drafted by the dash in 2019 is now with uh, Louisville but with her she went to Ole Miss and she has she broke a record for um, career points of Ole Miss uh, wow. she, I think she has 119 career points which was a record uh, 48 goals which was a um, if, sorry not career record a uh, program record you know she has all sorts of titles to her name she was the 2018 SEC goals assist points leader um, wow. In the SEC, well, that's that's saying a whole yeah, lot. Any of you right. know college soccer? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you know, it, because of the players that Louisville's missing, and the other players are young, I don't think they're going to be out there blazing a trail. But <laughs> like I was saying, it's it's a team where don't tell them that they're going to lose because they won't listen. And I think once they do get a lot of their bigger players back, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, you know, even if it's next year, once it's kind of a fresh start. They could be a dangerous team despite being relatively new to the league. Yeah, it's interesting because you have these two teams. You have Louisville and then you have Kansas City, both of whom are going to be, you know, starting their their first season in the league technically uh, this year, but coming in with just completely different outlooks. You know, Louisville is your typical expansion team and they have that expansion feel to them. And Kansas yeah. City, as you said earlier, that's basically a, a, a relocated team. It's a team that has existed for years, pretty much. Uh, mm-hmm. And so it's just interesting to see that you have these two teams that are coming from such different places. Yeah, it has its positives and negatives too, of course. I mean, I think if you look at Louisville on its face in the players they've got, if, well, if they were at full strength, that is objectively a better team. And that comes through the expansion draft and whatnot, mm-hmm. you know. He being able to pick up some of the top players while at the end of the day, on the positive side for Kansas City, is it's a team who already knows each other, they're used to playing with each other, but it's also a team that failed to make the playoffs every year um, in Utah. 
Right. Um, you know, you can change city, you can change name, and you can change coaches. And I mean, obviously, a coach change is a big one. But at the end of the day, it's still a group of players who, for the most part, you know, we've failed to make a playoffs in the last several years. Yeah. So it, it's going to be a tough one for Kansas City. I think we could see a huge change, or it could be a little <laughs> bit the same old, same old, unfortunately. So, yeah, go on. Well, I, I, I want to say that I want to talk about the NWSL as a league. We know that obviously the goal is to grow, of course, uh, and that's going to be the goal for, for any sports league until you get to the level of the NFL, MLB, NHL, you know, that, that kind of deal. Um, so... For the NWSL to grow, of course, they're going to have to add teams and new markets. It seems to me that when you look at specifically Louisville, the newest expansion team, the mm -hmm. expansion process and the way the draft works and all that kind of stuff seems to be fairly uh, friendly to expansion clubs. It seems like the goal is to make sure that expansion clubs can compete early yep. on. I mean, from year one, essentially, they want those expansion clubs to be able to uh, to make an impact. It's something similar to what we've seen the NHL do when Vegas expanded, and the NHL wanted Vegas to be able to compete early, so they kind of they kind of structured the rules so that you know Vegas would have an advantage over what we see from expansion teams maybe in other leagues. Um, so if the NWSL does plan on expanding further into new markets, maybe targeting uh, the St. Louis market, possibly. We talk, uh, you know, we talk about capital of American soccer. St. Louis is in the conversation as well. If that's going to be in the future, uh, what should the expansion process continue to look like this? Should expansion teams be able to compete early on? Um, I think yeah, that's a really good question. It's a tough one, honestly. And I mean, you, you just have to look even in the past couple of years, you know, obviously there's the Kansas City that we talked about where coming in 2013, they're winning the league 2014, 2015, but even more recently the North Carolina Courage, you know, they picked up their, um, the Western New York Flashers franchise rights once they left the league and mm -hmm. NC Courage picked those up in 2017. And then by 2018, they won the NWS <laughs> Shields and Championship. Mm -hmm. And then 2019, they win it again. So, so you know, then you, then you do begin to ask, and you look at the Louisville team, is it maybe a bit too overpowered? Because, you know, that's got to be tough for other teams who've been in the league for a while, and they're going through rebuilds, or it's up mm -hmm. and down, it's a process, and yeah. getting a new team can come in. And because of how the expansion draft rules work, and just the... Uh, because there's, I mean, there is a lack of teams at the end of the day, right? You know, you, if yeah. there's only 10 at the moment. You know, you've got Angel City coming in. Like you said, you can look at teams like, well, cities like St. Louis and Utah will hopefully come back. Uh, they do have a seat at the table, they've been told. So, you know, as more, as, yeah, I mean, I can look up. I think it's till 2022. I think if Utah could get a team together, mm -hmm. they're saying yes, but more than welcome back in the league. Uh, just because of that whole situation. So, you know, we we could be looking at at least 12 teams in a gang. Well, you know, we're 10 now, another two teams in the next couple of years. Um, and where, as you get more teams, obviously the players get spread a bit more thin. Uh, but right now with the NWSL, every team, or you think every team obviously is, like Sky Blue FC is a bit, eh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, but for the most part, every team can have those big players just because there's kind of a scarcity of teams, I guess, that we can go to. Mm -hmm. So as, as the league grows, as there's more teams, I think we will see it be made a little bit harder for these expansion teams to come in and just dominate right off the bat. Yeah. But it, I, early on, I'd say it's a good question because there's positives and negatives to both. At the end of the day, you also don't want a new team to come in and be the whipping, I say whipping boys, whipping girls of the league. I don't know what, what all that could be weird. Um, I understand the point. Yeah, I understand the point. Yeah. But yeah, so you don't want to just be like way below the rest of the competition when there's only right. 10 teams. So it's a, it's a tough thing to balance right now. Yeah, and it's such an interesting situation as well because you have on the one hand, the NWSL as a league is growing, but they don't look like, in terms of the talent, a league that is growing. They look like a league that is established. When you look at the amount of talent 
from you know those of us who are soccer fans we know a lot of these players from the national from the international scene uh you know performing for their countries and so we look at this and say there are a lot of really high quality players here that we'll see in world cups and olympic games and things like that so the nwsl is kind of in this weird place where they as a league are are trying to grow but from the talent perspective they're pretty much already there as you said earlier they're kind of one of the big three leagues in terms of talent so it puts any potential expansion club in a very weird position uh, yeah. And and it leads to, I think, uh, something interesting that we're seeing, which is that uh, these kinds of I, I would say I would say any potential expansion team, they're looking at getting into this and saying, you know what? The NWSL is going to be friendly to us. They're, they're going to try yeah. to help us win. And to me, if you are someone who, you know, you, you've got some money and you're looking to expand and you're saying, you know, I can get into this and start a business here in the NWSL. The league's going to be friendly to me and, and help me compete early on. I think that's what a league should be doing when they're trying to grow. Yeah, and I think we we also should clarify, you know, when we're talking about a league trying to grow and we're saying, oh, even then, the NWSL is probably one of the top three along with France and England. Mm-hmm. Like, they're trying to grow in the sense of figure women's game. I mean, again, they're one of the biggest blitz gangs to the point of, you know, being on TV and being followed as much as the men's sports, and again, that's a whole new argument right there. The whole that whole that we we've talked about off air plenty of times. Uh, but, but yeah, so when when we're talking about we're trying to grow, of course, in the women's game itself, that's why the best players are coming here. It it doesn't have to grow, quote unquote, to catch up to any of the other women's leagues. It just has to grow in the sense of to be in a public eye of, you know, on the public conscience of the typical American. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and the working towards it, I think, you know, it's, the last couple of years has helped towards that. Obviously, the last year, the NWSL was the first professional sport to come back in America, uh, get the Challenge Cup, and it was on TV, and that, you know, that had some great viewership. And yeah. if you look at it as an account I follow, uh, it's looks at all the major sports, it's on Twitter, it looks at all the major sports teams, like all the Twitter accounts, and it looks at the, uh, the engagement based off, you know, how many followers they have and the growth and whatnot. And, you know, this is factoring in NFL teams and Premier League teams and all sorts. And obviously, it, like, the yeah, NWSL seems to have a smaller follower base. Obviously, you know, some of these, like, Premier League teams. But when it comes to the engagement, uh, basically, what this account does is it ranks every week the top five engagement proof, um, engagement accounts. And for the most part, NWSL teams are taking up three to four of that top five every wow. every week. Uh, you know, Kansas City NWSL has been up there for a while, just because you know new team coming in. Again, Racing Louisville's been up there. I saw North Carolina Courage was up there for a while. You know, it, it's. The slower follower base, but the engagement is up there despite having that lower kind of following base to you know, fees off of. So, you know, it, it is gaining attention even just compared to a couple of years ago for sure. Yeah. Uh, I forgot where my point going off this was. I think it's just, you know, growth of the league, I guess. Yeah, uh, and it, from, from, from the NWSL's perspective, it is kind of fighting a war on two fronts, if you will, because not only are you trying to grow the league. Uh, in the sense of getting more fans, but the sport of soccer itself is also growing in the U.S. in popularity. Yep. So they're yep. trying to they're trying to fight that war as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are. Uh, I mean, it's like I text you this morning just the sports of soccer as a whole, and I was in quick trip wearing my Liverpool jersey, and then literally in just a, a random quick trip. If you guys aren't from the Midwest, it's our best <laughs> gas station. Um, <laughs> Number hey, one yeah. in the gas station power rankings. Absolutely number one. Casey is close number second. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then come and go, number three. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> but no. Um, yeah, I know. There's a Liverpool shirt. There was a, a US men's national team jersey in Mexico, a Barcelona, and a Marseille jersey. Just all all in a single gas station. I'm like, what the hell's going on? It's just like a. <laughs> Venturing in this quick trip, I didn't know about. But no, I've got to you wasn't you wasn't have seen that ten years ago. 
No, no, absolutely not. You probably wouldn't have seen the the men's national team jersey ten years ago. Yeah, you the only jersey would have been fourteen year old me with a my stupid accent, <laughs> a Liverpool jersey. Um, but no, so yeah, they are fighting on the two fronts of growing their own league and to you know compete with. I guess the competitors are quote unquote competitors. So it was MLS. You know, how can we get the same kind of viewership as MLS? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, yeah, just being part of the overall growth of soccer in the, in the US. Right. I, I, I think I'm, it's honestly helping them because you look at the, uh, the Women's Super League out in England, as I know much about France, uh, honestly, I know they have some, you know, they have Lyon and Paris FC and whatnot, and PSG's there. Um, but for England, yeah, you know, they have. Big, big, like all of their teams are uh, like the affiliates to the men's teams like it's just Chelsea, Liverpool, Tottenham, blah 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 yeah. and you know big players do though a lot of the English players are still there um, Sam Kerr I mean she's in the short history of the NWSL I mean she's a NWSL grace I mean you know two time MVP, three time golden boot winner uh, for Chicago wow. Like you know so yeah she, she jumps over to England's but from especially when I lived there again this was I moved here in 2011 but even just you know like I watch Sky Sports News um, a couple of times a week and just from talking to people back in England you don't hear anything about the Women's Super League like nothing it's because it's so overshadowed by the Premier League and there isn't this yeah. push for soccer while here because there's, there's the put MLS you know MLS is I think it's getting better and better by the year. Again, we have, we've had these arguments so many times. Right. Uh, but it's, it's obviously not to the level of Europe, and this goes back to our debate of last year with the US men's national team. You know, they don't have that cloud yet. They're still trying to build in the US. Right. So again, get NWSL to, you know, I, I don't want to say hop on that train, but, you know, kind of help steer that train. It's, yeah. it's a pair of them working to build soccer in this country. And that's really playing into their hands as well to getting the public eye a little bit more. Well, that's it's it's really interesting. It's a great point that you make because it's the difference between getting in on the ground floor versus and hoping that that building gets built into a skyscraper versus yeah. that building is already a hundred stories, and you have yeah. to kind of find where you where you slot in. And mm-hmm. so maybe it's kind of an advantage for the NWSL to be starting in a country where the game of soccer is growing so fast. It's not at the level that it is in those European countries, uh, Mm -hmm. but it's growing. And I think the way that you help that is you start to cross over with people that non-soccer fans would know and start to kind of get them interested in saying, you know, what is this? Let me look at this. I've heard about the U.S. women's national team and, and, and you know, kind of going along those lines. And the North Carolina Courage, they have done that. So Naomi Osaka, the uh, the tennis player, former world number one, uh, obviously multiple-time Grand Slam champion, uh, one of the most recognizable faces in tennis right now, she bought an ownership stake in uh, in the North Carolina Courage and that is someone who a lot of people know. She's one of the most popular athletes uh, on the planet. And so to see her getting involved with something like that, uh, that's just you know kind of more ammunition for the NWSL when it comes to getting more and more people to to come watch the product. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you have a soccer. You have Serena Williams, who is a part owner in Angel City FC, mm-hmm. uh, coming into the league in 2022. Uh, not quite as big of a name. This is more just the Kansas City side, but you know when you've got Patrick Mahomes' fiance, Brittany Matthews, she's a part owner in the NWSL team, mm-hmm. um, and you know people might not, especially like football fans, they might not know soccer in the NWSL too much, but they sure as hell know Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> That's um, right. And you know it's well, when the, the star child of this city, his fiance, is a part owner in a team, you know. That's helped build some sort of, you know, following and base for them to go off of too. Yeah. Um, and I mean, both of those, both of those guys have been showing up to the games. When I was at the K State game the other night, um, you know, they, they walked right past me, just exchanged quick, um, you know, quick pleasantries. But they came straight from the Royals game, which Patrick Mahomes has a 
uh, part part owner staking straight into the NWSL teams game. Wow! You know they're they're making a presence seen. Uh, you know they were taking pictures with after the fact, like it was a it was like Swope Soccer Village where a lot of youth teams play. So afterwards they were taking pictures with fans and stuff as well. Mm-hmm. All that stuff helps for sure. So when again when you're getting these big names into you know owning whatever you call it, like only teams, that's great. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, of course, we can get on to the, uh, the US Women's National Team. I mean, you know, uh, everyone knows so, you know, the big names on that team, whether it's Megan Rapino and, say, Alex Morgan's been in the spotlight for years. And right. Again, it, it's a whole argument, but it was Rapino And who else just went to the White House? Um, Margaret Pierce, I think it was. Yeah, the pair of them, they go to the White House, you know, and now they're in the political eye and they're talking to Joe Biden, and it's just. Obviously, that's more. That was more along the lines of the equal pay side of things. But when you're getting these, you know, US women's soccer stars in the public eye, it can only help but mm-hmm. grow the game or at least bring awareness to the league, right? Yeah, and, and when it comes to that, there's another name who's kind of been out there because of her pedigree, and that is Trinity Rodman, over yes. uh, just drafted to the Washington Spirit. Um, obviously, her father, Dennis, uh, almost every American sports fan knows Dennis Rodman, played for the uh, Pistons teams in the 90s and then played for the Bulls teams. They did the three-peat, and of course, there was that massively successful uh, Last Chance documentary that he played a big part in. And so I think that's you're kind of starting to from the NWSL's perspective when you try to make new stars having someone come in obviously incredibly talented Trinity Rodman is this isn't like a handout you know obviously she's talented um pick I think by a single minute in college uh, yeah which which is crazy to me but you know we see that we see that in baseball we see that in hockey so uh you know the NWSL being being again pretty kind to the athletes if they want to go try to make some money um but, you know, from that perspective, when you try to build new stars, you know, it's all well and good to have the U.S. Women's National Team having their players there. And there are the established stars that we know about, like you just mentioned. But at some point, you do have to look at building new stars, who is going to be the face of the league. And Trinity Rodman seems like as good a face as any, given her pedigree, given her ability. Um, and so the NWSL, I kind of like that they're a little forward thinking when it comes to that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know how forward thinking it was in uh, Washington Spirit saying, ah, we're going to, you know, take Trinity Rogman because of Dennis Rogman, of course, you know. Maybe that dig playing to pass with just shirt sales and stuff, but I mean, you always have to bear in mind that, you know, she, I don't know if the family now lives in Washington, but she went to college at Washington State. Um, so, you know, it's. Well, I guess it's, I guess Washington State is the other side, so the country is a Washington Spirit, right? <laughs> Different Washingtons. Uh, so I got into this a little bit moose. I didn't say she's kind of local, but she's not. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, but even then, like, you know, everyone knew even heading into the draft, despite not playing a single minute of college because of COVID, um, she, everyone knew her talent. So if she can build upon that talent, mm-hmm. you know, actually be the star that people hope she's going to be. Right. And yeah, of course, you know, I got to be another face for the league uh, and, and, and a face that touches other markets. I mean, you know, you, you like to think that at least she's not going to live off the dad's name, of course, but it, it will touch the NBA market whether she likes it or not. Yeah, well, so. I think, I think you know, when, when you are the NWSL, you shouldn't shy away from using those kinds of connections that you have. Trinity Rodman is going to be a big name uh, because of who her dad is, it's not her fault that you know her dad is so recognizable. But again, at this point, any way you can bring in a star, any way you can make a star that people are going to know, uh, you know, to me, I think that's that's from the NWSL's perspective what they need to do. And it's not only just her. I mean, you already have young players that are making their names on the national team level of course Mallory Pugh someone I'm a really big fan of uh, she's over with Sky Blue F- or uh, Chicago rather now after Chicago, she man. was traded um, but so she's there Lindsay Horan is starting to make a real name for himself on the international on the international stage um, and so you know when it comes to building stars for me however you can do it 
you want to have those names that are recognizable that people are going to immediately uh you know connect mm -hmm. with with the national women's soccer league yeah no i think one of those names you did mention lindsay Garang. uh i think you know she could be instrumental going forward you know she's not She's been in the league a couple of years now. She's been on the U.S. Women's National Team a couple of years. But uh, I think the, one of the really interesting things that I've heard from with her is I was taught, I, I was telling you earlier about my Mallory Weber interview. Because, um, you know, she's coming back to Kansas City later this month. And it, it was just a, like a fun little Q&A kind of thing. And I asked her, you know, I asked her what, who her favorite player of all time is. It was Messi, just so you know. <laughs> but um, I also asked her like, a favorite player who she's played with, and she said Lindsay Horan, who they're about the same age. Mm -hmm. um, and she said, uh, Molly Weber, she was with Portland from 2016 to 19. Like, she's been there for like their championships too. And, um, you know, she, she got there around the same time that Lindsay Horan got there. And despite yeah. her young age, uh, she said Horan was what probably you know, one of the leaders on that team. and she was helping her with, you know, getting settled in and drills and, just, you know, just being a leader, basically, at yeah. 10th age of 21, 22. So, you know, especially, I don't know if the trend continues, but I feel like especially the women's soccer, the gates do tend to play a lot longer as well. You know what I mean? You look like, I mean, Rapino is no spring chicken. Uh, Sabrung isn't. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, Carly Lloyd. You know, yeah, these are players right. who are, are still solid players. Um, I like mean, Abby play, Wambach but, played into her late 30s. And she, that's you know, what I'm she saying. She was the most recognizable player for the U.S. for a long, long time. Yeah, no, exactly. So, you know, when you've got a player who already has a name for herself now, like 25, and if she can keep up those playing levels and keep on doing what she's doing for the next 10, 12, 14 years, then Christ, you know, it's... If they can keep winning the World Cup, so that's another player who could be an all-time great if she keeps yeah. on the trajectory. Yeah, you you are absolutely right. Uh, I cannot let you go from this video without getting a prediction on the record about what we might be seeing from the NWSL this season. Uh, as I mentioned, the Challenge Cup will uh, kick off here in a few days, beginning on April 9th, and then on May 15th, the regular season will begin. It will be 24 games. Uh, when you look back at the 2020 Challenge Cup, that was one, or at least uh, North Carolina Courage ha had the most points in the four games that were played there. They won them all. And then in the four-game 2020 Fall Series, uh, Portland won that one. Mm -hmm. uh, so from you, the expert now on the National Women's Soccer League, what are you looking for this season? Who is going to be the team? Who is going to win it all? You ask such tough questions, Griff. Um, <laughs> That's my I, job. I think, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm not going to go the easy option of saying Portland because we talked about how they could be losing so many players. Obviously, go up, they will be up there. And I think the other big one, though, is I kind of I teased on them earlier with it was OL Rain, who you know we've not really talked much about either. Um, at all today, but they could definitely be in with a shout for that too. They've, they've always, um, they were always been defend not always, but they've been def very good defensively the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, they brought in former England number one goalkeeper Karen Bardsley. Uh, you know, you've got Megan Rapino coming back. They just traded for Tazara King, who was a standout on that Utah team and came to Kansas City. Uh, she probably would have been rookie of the season in 2020, obviously. Um, they brought in Angelina, who, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say is the next, like, you know, Mars or Dabinia or someone. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's done it all for Brazil through all the youth levels, as their captain in those youth levels. So, and they don't have that many players who would be taking away from the league, taking away from the team because of Olympic duties and whatnot. Like, they'll be affected just as much as other teams, but it's not over the top so right it, it's uh, it's not like a situation that we talked about earlier with some of these teams where they're going to get just absolutely ravaged yeah. by some of these yeah. national team call-ups exactly so uh and, and, you know especially with the backing of leon behind them you know who knows if they bring in more players at the end of the day i think 
I don't know if they made it a ruling on this, but because they're connected with Leon, there's no reason why they can't loan players to each other either. So you, know, you ask, you know, are going to be loaning players from Leon later in the season? I know that was a question when the takeover first happened. So now I think Leon is a, um, or well, OL Reign is an excellent option. For, to first, not a surprise, but a, a great challenger to Portland. Okay, if there were going to be a surprise, who would it be? Um, I, I know I, I unfairly talk crap on Sky Blue FC earlier. I did. <laughs> um, but if we don't talk about an, a surprise, you know, I, I'm not going to go out and make them a favour, so I'm not even going to claim that, yes, they are going to go out and, you know, challenge properly, but I, I wasn't counting them out either. Uh, you know, they, they just lost their team captain, Sarah Walmo, and we talked about Mallory Pugh uh, to Chicago, but, um, you know, they still got Carly Lloyd, who we were talking, is, you know, she's getting on, but these players play till later in their career. Um, they had Evelyn Viennes, who, you know, she's coming back from Paris FC. Uh, she got 11 goals in 14 games there. They have a great back line with Gina Lewandowski and Estelle Johnson. Um, and then you have uh, Kaylin Shows in, in goal, who I, is sneakily one of the top goalkeepers in the league. Wow. So, Apparently you, you your know, cat is a big fan of Kaylin Sheridan as well. Yeah, she's trying to get out. It's, <laughs> I know. I'll bring, you, I'll bring my laptop while I open the door. But yeah, um, so you, you can definitely be one of those sneaky teams that could, you know, maybe do something. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and from Sky Blue FC's perspective as well, uh, they draft Brianna Pinto out of North Carolina in the first round this season. Uh, Pinto is a tremendous player for any of you who follow college soccer. She has been a standout for her career at North Carolina, obviously one of the powerhouse teams. So uh, it certainly seems like there is a lot of youth going to Sky Blue right now after trading away uh, Waldmo and Pew for two first rounders. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes that youth, you know, can can really gel. We've seen it happen before, uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if if Sky Blue, you know, makes that makes that run and, and starts to compete near the top again. I don't know if I don't know if they're going to win the whole thing, uh, but yeah. at least at least they're closer to competing than it may seem like they are on the surface. Yeah, I think if we're sitting in being realistic, I mean. You know, like you've got NC Courage, the Houston Dash will probably keep doing what they're doing. Um, Portland, the Rain. So, you know, you could, on paper, all teams who are on paper, quote unquote, better. But, uh, again, Sky Blue, if, you know, if they have a good draw and if they gel well, like you were saying, that could absolutely be a team. You know, they sneak a top four finish, get into the playoffs, and who knows what happens then, right? Yeah, well, you know oh, yeah. what? That's that's the fun of the playoffs. Yeah, it's difficult for one advantage of the playoffs. <laughs> we could have a we could get into a whole other video talking about whether the NWSL and the MLS uh, should have playoffs or not. But I think yeah. that will be reserved for a different time. Sean, thanks so much, man, coming on talking about the National Women's Soccer League. Again, the 2021 Challenge Cup kicks off in just a couple days, Friday, April 9th. The regular season will begin on May 15th. Uh, you can see all of the games either on CBS Sports Network or on Paramount+. Plus. So if you got nothing to do while these games are going on, uh, check it out. You will I guarantee you, you will see players that you recognize uh, that maybe you weren't expecting, but almost every team has a recognizable player. And uh, not only that, but players that you can really get behind and, and have fun watching. Uh, the NWSL, one of the fastest growing leagues right now in America. And Sean Goodwin is on top of everything. Again, Sean Goodwin writes over for the Kansas City Star. And Sean, please tell the people where they can find you for NWSL coverage. Yes, I will. I, uh, and you, you can find me on Twitter, just Sean Goodwin KC, S H A U N, and Goodwin KC. And then, yeah, all my coverage is uh, just KansasCity.com. If you're feeling generous, post my stuff on Reddit. I, I don't do that myself. I feel like that's a little vain. But when I see my stuff on Reddit, I always get happy. I'm like, ah, someone like this enough to share it. So yeah, feel free to share my stuff on Reddit because you get a lot of views from there. You'll be surprised. Yeah, yeah. well, it makes that's sense. That's my to me. That's my claim. I uh, not claim. I'm just begging at this point. So. <laughs> 
Well, that's what we're all doing at the end of the day. But there you go. Follow Sean on Twitter for all your NWSL coverage. Go check him out. And, of course, subscribe here. I don't think that this will be the last NWSL video that we do on general admission sports. So thank you so much for joining us here. Subscribe. Catch all of our coverage now and in the future. We appreciate you. Say a mass, say a mass, I